I'm working in a department called System Integration. So what we do is just we try to evaluate always every new technology. And I believe today, Tommaso, he talked about, uh, about EME, and we said, okay, we'll be showing some of our experimental stuff that, uh, that we had on, uh, on AME as a new technology. So a little bit, first I will be just, this is my agenda, and just a little bit, a couple of words about CSCS. I mean, as usual, they sponsor us, and if I don't talk about them, they will not send me back again here. So, so it's better always to just talk about them. Uh, first of all, I mean, maybe I will just be talking a little bit less about it since Tommaso covered this part today. Benefits, a system that we used, the benchmark tools that we used also results and what's what's what will be coming up next. So we are we are located in the southern part of Switzerland, in the Italian side, and we are just close to the border of Italy. Um, funded in 1991. It's like any, any research center. Like since it's, since uh, we had the mission changed with time, now we are just a national one, and most of the universities just run their, their project, scientific project in our system. And even they could, even they could uh, install their own system. So we have some systems from ETH. They are installed in our, in our building. And this is operated by ETH. So it's our headquarters is just ETH. So these are just back to history since the vector machines. I started CSCS in 2001 in April and uh, I remember these two systems actually. That was in production for the climate and that was as backup system at the time. So it just, you know, 1996 was installed and until 2001 it was still in production. That was impressive. I mean, long life of these systems. And these are just the variation of these systems, back from, from vector machines to massive parallel machines and ending up now with what we have. This is Pitstein, which is a Sandy Bridge system. It's a hybrid machine between GPU and the Sandy Bridge. So what's interesting, I mean, back, back at the time of the vector machines, when, uh, when anyone would present an HPC system, we'll be just talking about a supercomputing. That's it. But with time, that changed. So it's not only talking about supercomputing, you want to talk about power, cooling, and all this stuff. And one of them is just the cooling, which is quite interesting what we have. So we pulled the water from the lake, crossing the city of Lugano to CSCS, and just a, a circuit, a closed circuit that will just be cooling a different uh, circuit at CSCS. And that's how we cool our machine. So in theory, this is a free cooling system. We only have these two pumps that from, uh, from the numbers, they are just quite big. So 700 liters per second, that's a peak performance. And it's operating now so far at 500. Did you have you any problem with the, with the, you know, the green people? For yes, uh, so it was. Uh, that's an interesting question. That's special in Switzerland, actually. <laughs> so we had we a had long, long debate with the green people. So the, we pulled the water down at like 40 meters at five or six degrees and then come back at the surface of the water. So the difference should be always like two to three degrees when it arrives back to the lake. So we need to guarantee that actually to avoid having this huge difference in temperature. But in fact, it was a, a lot of benefits for, uh, for the lake because the lake in Lugano is quite very calm. So no oxygen is coming to the lake. And now by making the circulation, it's just helping also to getting more oxygen. So it was benefits for the lake. That's it about CSCS. Yes. I think we talked enough. So I am me. You know, as a verse buffer, an engine memory, um, infinite memory engine, I think it's, uh, Tommaso did a lot, good job, it just explained about everything about it. So just, somehow just imagine a layer between the application and the file system, where when I write, instead of writing directly first to the file system, I write to this caching layer. And I will just benefit from, the, from this high speed of this caching layer. This picture actually from, from, uh, from DDN. Uh, so I'll just jump this one. This is uh, just more technical layout showing where it sits. So you can go straight actually from the client to the file system, or you just could process this way by adding this, by calling this library, the IME library. In this case, everything you'll be writing, it will go straight first here, and then will get migrated. Uh, the migration part that we'll be just discussing later, that could be done automatically or could be done 
on request, uh, there should be some settings and policies. Actually, Didian could maybe mention more details about how this migration could take place. But that's all should be configurable. You could just all optimize that and change, it, make make changes the way that you want. Okay, this is our some benefits. I mentioned some of them. So we accelerate the I/O. That's definitely. I mean, if I have a slow. Um, uh, file system, whatever kind of file system here, I just accelerate it. Um, uh, I reorganize the, the way I do I/O. So, uh, Richard mentioned something about that. There's an initiative about applications, how they are using network, and which application requires network. I remember in seven years ago, I sent a request to all our application people at CSCS asking, does your application require any I/O? And the answer was, I did not get an answer, actually, zero. Nobody answered me saying, OK, my applications require the high I.O. And this. So I said, OK, let's, let's go for a bigger site. So I went to Yulish, and I asked the same question and the same answer. So nobody came back and said, OK, that application is really suffering from the I.O. So knowing what the application is doing is a big, uh, is very challenging. The way that the knowing the application, what it's doing on the network, and I remember two years ago, before we started this project, we had a guy from, from ETH said, I'm ready to just take down your file system on its knee, whatever file system you have at CSCS. And he used CP2K. So he modified CP2K in a way that he could run it and take the file system on its knee. When he, st when he ran the test, he reached up 30 gigabytes per second, while our, our file system you could you could reach 130 gigawatt per second on on uh, IOR benchmark, so he never managed to do that. And we start analyzing what's going on and why he failed. Also, he optimized that that code to run in this way. And uh, the reason was that the way the application was using the the size and how random and the way it's writing to the file system. Benchmark we usually use sequential write. We don't go for Especially when we are reading, we don't go for this, what we call seek, and then read, and seek, whatever, in, in a mechanical disk. But he was, going he was not going sequential to gain from uh, avoiding the seek, but he was going random with a very, very small block size. And that was, it was a success, actually, for him to go 30 gigabytes per second, because usually you get really less than that. Especially on, uh, on a file system, it's luster, and with, a, with really quite big... Uh, blocks are configured to. So that's why such solution could, could, could really be, have a, a huge advantage here because what, the way whatever you write, random, sequential, that will be reorganized the way that you write and it will be written in a way that go sequential all with the file system but to the caching since I don't have the mechanical problem that will, be, that will handle any, any random and will not suffer from it. Low latency, and that's fundamental actually, especially when it has to do with, with, with IOPS, plus POSIX and non-POSIX. So the IME library just goes non-POSIX, and uh, POSIX is just something that everybody hates, but I don't know if we can live without it. So we, we hear many people talking about it, and it's very interesting, but we always find that, yeah, it's there, we need it, and just we cannot run away from it. So this is uh, the system. I'll just talk a little bit about the system that we use. What we have here, just this is a slow hardware, and we build a top of it luster. So we are talking here about um, uh, very, very um, uh, slow file system from the hard point of view. So we're talking about like three gigabyte per second. So if you go with sequential using IOR, you will reach like three gigabytes per second, not more. And this was done on purpose because we would like to have a very slow file system and then we start testing IME and see that's the different advantage of how much could give us. At the top of, 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 of the rack here, we have four servers and every server has 24 SSDs. So in total, we had this uh, 96 SSDs from, from total that create what we call this, the IME burst buffer. I think there's one, uh, one slide will go more details about the interconnect in the back side. At the top here, we have just the switches, Ethernet, and uh, InfiniBand. This is uh, the FDR. So for Luster, 
we talked about the, the hardware itself. These are there are two OSSs, one NDS, two enclosures, 120 disks, one dual controller. Well, it's three gigabyte per second at one megabyte block size, so plus sequential writing. These are more details. It's four four times dual sockets. I believe these are Ivy Bridge, 24 SSDs, two IBHJs FDR. So that's what. Um, I'll just say why we had two IBA, for, uh, two InfiniBand for every server, 128 gigabyte of, of memory. So the um, per server, what we had, we had 24 disks. To be able to deliver access to these 24 disks, we had to put two controllers inside the machine. And every controller was sitting on one socket. To be able to avoid QPI, and we avoid all the latency, all the sequ uh, consequences of the QPI in the back, so we had to put two InfiniBand. And from the library itself, you'll be writing. When you write to controller one, you go to uh, you go to the first controller, and when you write to IB two, you go to the second controller. So in this case, you go directly to the SSDs and the controller of the SSDs. That's showing how it is. These are the 24 disks, socket zero and one, QPI in between. These are the two controllers over PCI Express, and these are the, the IB interconnect the IB interfaces. So these at the beginning were dual ports FDR. Recently I migrated them to EDR. So we have now two EDR on every node. And um, honestly, the, the, looking at what this one, what every controller could deliver, we are not expecting to see an advantage. But in this case, I have only one port instead of having two here. And the plan is just later we'll be adding something at the top of it. So whatever will be changing in the background to gain something, the, the EDR part will just giving us some advantage. Okay, so this is, uh, this is some, some results showing what, what we gain. So what we talked before about three gigabyte per second of bandwidth the storage could deliver. And here we can see that we are just above 35 gigabyte per second. And this is in both cases, we're talking about read and write, maybe a little bit, the read a little bit less. So that wha what we used here is a typical uh, synthetic benchmark. Here I was on plus one meg block size, and these are the number of threads. So here are 16 nodes we had, and then we were scaling with the number of, thread of threads per node. So that's what you can see. This was the number. You definitely you need a certain number of, uh, of nodes, so it's minimum Six, I, I can't remember if that was um, uh, 8 times 2 with, with 2 threads per node or it was uh, 16 nodes when we generated this, this information. Since my system gets changed most of the time, front end time, we changed always. This is IOR and this is using the IME natively. So what we have here is like 37 gigabyte with the block size of from 4K to 8 meg. And you can see that what's going on is just no changes. I mean, almost the same, the same result at all levels. Now, this is that's very interesting. Now, we'll just go deep a little bit about discussing that part because it's quite interesting to see. I mean, with 4K block size, with 36 gigabyte per second, that's a huge number. And we'll see it here. So we have 37 gigabyte per second at 4K block size. That's roughly 9.6 million IOPS. Just simple calculation. Now if I take 96 disks, SSDs, SSD could deliver 30K IOPS per SSD. If I multiply 96 by 30, that's 2.8 million IOPS. So what's going on? These numbers here, at least for the 4K, there's something wrong. I mean, why I can see these 9.6 million IOPS, while the SSDs could deliver 2.8 million. Any idea? Okay. So that's what's going on. So IME, in principle, you will, when, when you're writing 4K, because it's just elaborate on the way that we write data to, uh, to disk, this will change. So the 4K will not finalize as 4K. It will be changing. This will be replaced by, by ME itself. And the blocks will change. So if you look at, at what's going on here, the number of IOs and the number of megabytes 
for one device, that's one disk only, we can see that's going on at 128K kilobyte per second, not 4K. And that's what IME is doing in the background. So it's taking it 4K and changing that from 4K to 128. So when it's what the final way of writing it, 128K block size, not 4K. And that's why I can see. So if that's very transparent to, to to, to user, because you will always be writing at 4K and you will be gaining these IOPS, so it's not fake what's going on, but the final destination that will change from 4K to 120A to be able to correspond to this and make that make sense. Because if, if, if that's not happening in the background, really is a problem because there's something wrong here, or I'm using the memory and I'm caching everything, or there's something wrong, and then a certain size that will not be very helpful. So that was the work that it took us some time to be able to understand what's going on. Because to be honest, I mean, this information was not delivered by DDN at the beginning. So when I discovered this, I just went back to DDN and I said, okay, look, I can see this. So could you explain? I said, yeah, you are right with what you are saying because that will change to 128. And it was interesting to see how they are doing it in the background. And that's going on at the read and the write. This is every device, and you can see these are the, the four servers. This is one server, actually. And that's for every disk, what every disk is doing. And you can see from read and write, and that's during that, uh, the test, this is what we were doing, actually. So they have a nice scripting way of monitoring what's going on at every small device and how these data are, are getting delivered. In, in these tests, with all this huge size, we have never seen any bottleneck on the infiniband part. And that was delivered without any. So we had no issue, we had no uh, problem on the infiniband. We have, uh, that were covered by the FDR. And that was what really nice to see, actually. So what's next step? I think I'm just maybe I run a little bit fast, and then, so you'll have enough time. You'll have. So uh, what's next step? So we are still looking on on the migrating of data, and that's what I mentioned at the beginning. How we want to migrate this data from the caching layer to the disks. Multi-rail implementation. These are some of the information I got it from from DDN. Schedule integration, the quote. SRNet support, data management policy engine, and third party support. Now, there are more than that. What uh, I could just say one thing about IME. Recently, we have seen that the caching and buff and, and uh, buffering level between the file system and applications taking place a lot. And there are a lot of initiatives going on. So, for instance, now with, with, uh, with the new kernels, you can see B cache is available, DM cache is available, M cache is available. And the many of these are coming from the, from the operating system. And what you do with, with the new kernels, so what you do is simply you just put one big SSD and multiple couple of uh, two, four terabyte disks, and you map these disks to the, um, to the IDE disks that they are very slow. And then when you write and read, you will be writing to the SSD and then data get migrated automatically. But all these solutions are individual, so it's only for the local disk, for the local server. So we are, here we are talking about parallelizing that and doing that in the background of the file system, parallel file system, Luster, GPFS, whatever, since it's completely independent about what the file system could be. So you just you take the, the, the caching layer, you just deploy it, you map it, map it to the file system, and then you start writing. So whatever the file system, whatever the hardware is, since all this hardware that we had that I showed before, are um, we, we build it ourselves. It has nothing to do with DDN, actually. I only get that, that software uh, stack, the, the library from, uh, uh, from DDN. I believe that's, that's my last one. So.